how you doing? I'm Van. Welcome back to the only channel on YouTube that does not take criticism unless you phrase it like a personal attack. I was rereading Harry Potter the other day, and by that I mean I was listening to the audiobook because I've read the book multiple times and I needed a new experience. But something that struck me while reading Harry Potter again is the presence of characters that you love to hate. These characters serve as either minor roadblocks, nuisances, or just generally leaders that you're ready to see leave when they do finally leave. But what about the characters that you don't want to leave, but you still love to hate them? Well, that's a bit more complicated now, isn't it? And that's a difficult path to walk, because if you take one step out of line, you end up falling in the I hate this character and want them to die, or I love this character and I don't want anything bad to happen to them. People tend to work in extremes, that's just how we are. Really, I feel as if these characters are necessary for the longevity and for the consistent success of any serialized program or movie. You have to have a character that engages you on all emotional levels. You'll have one you like, one you think is funny, one you think is sad, and then one you dislike. So I decided I was going to throw together a quick list of a bunch of characters who I kind of like, but mostly don't. This list is ordered from the ones that I hate the most to the ones that I tolerate the most. We're going to start at the bottom, we're going to start with the ones that I hate, and we're going to go to the ones that I like. You know, as of the date of me recording this video, J.K. Rowling hasn't tweeted for like 13 days. <laughs> She's in the mess around and find out era, I really feel like. Like the lawsuit from Amane is going to hopefully do her in for a little while. Myrtle deserved that ass whipping, didn't she? <laughs> Oh man, like that's gotta be one of the most cathartic scenes in any Disney animated movie ever is when Lilo just finally just beats the hell out of Myrtle for all the nonsense that she's been spouting. Myrtle's just a bitch. Like, I know she's a side character. I know she's a bit character. She's not one of the main characters, but it's so fun to hate on this child. She's mean for no reason. She's bratty. She's just obnoxious. If she's so hateable and so mean and so bratty and so nasty to Lilo, why is she on this list at all? Because I mentioned that I had to like them at least a little bit, right? It's for the catharsis. At that point, I'm a fan of Myrtle. Like, I, I understand the character. I understand the purpose. I know why she's there. I assumed she was just going to be another one of those characters who kind of made up with the hero at the end of the movie, and maybe a little bit if you watch the show, but Myrtle, no, she's just there to get her ass beat. <laughs> Yes, I like Ramsey Bolton more than Myrtle. <laughs> a lot of people may disagree with Ramsey Bolton being on this list, primarily because you have to like the character a little bit, but I gotta be honest, I like bad guys. I like awful, terrible, no good, very bad people. And it's not as if Ramsey is a simple character. None of the characters in Game of Thrones really are, some more than others, but Ramsey's complicated. He was raised in this lifestyle, but even more than that, he was raised in a crueler and meaner version of this lifestyle because he is the bastard son of Ramsey Bolton. You get to really see how bastards are treated in Game of Thrones early, early on with how everybody alienates Jon for the sake of his bastardness, bastardization, bastard qualities, I guess. And the Starks were generally pretty moderate people, all things considered. Like, when we meet them first, at least, let's clarify that. But Ramsay is a Bolton. He wasn't when you initially find him, because of course he is a bastard. But later on, he does such a good job with the... Reek. In his efforts to win his father's affection, he does a phenomenal job with Reek. Ends up being a pretty competent battlefield commander as well, actually being out on the field in the front lines with a lot of his guys. Ramsey's the type of guy that likes to get his hands dirty. He likes to have his hands on whatever it is that he's messing up. He, he just knows he can mess it up better than anybody else. That's all it is. And that competence, even if he's a villain, even if he is a predator, to put it mildly, he's a good villain. And of course, like, you're supposed to hate a villain but you can hate a villain without them being competent. You can hate a villain without them being a good character on top of that. And while Ramsay is far from the best character in Game of Thrones, he is definitely one of the better ones. I don't like him, but you know, he's better than Myrtle. <laughs> I'm gonna have two anime entries on this list. I could probably fill the entire list with annoying anime characters, but I'm not gonna do that. Both examples from anime on this list that I have are characters that are pretty much the same stereotype. They're the same cutout. But goddamn, Minette is annoying, dude. Like, ugh. One of the main problems with hateable characters is their tendency to stick around. Mineta is really, really good at this. From like the second episode, Mineta is in this series and he stays really consistently himself for the entire series. It's not a very good thing, but you know, I gotta give compliments where I can, I guess. He's loud, he's obnoxious, he wears a diaper in his hero uniform for some reason, don't know what that's about. But most of all, 
He's a pervert. That's the big one. You know, that's the big part of his character, and that's the big part of this stereotype as well. I'm not super sure how this character archetype is received in Japan, but given the fact that almost every single anime and manga that runs for more than a few chapters or, or a couple of years tends to have one of these characters because they do need comic relief, but I just think a lot of manga authors and writers don't really know how to make a funny character, because it's always the same shit. Most notorious example being Master Roshi from DBZ. It's the exact same thing. They're always shorter than everybody else, they're always louder than everybody else, and they're really prone to nosebleeds. Mineta doesn't get them that much, but R Roshi did. It's it, it probably the blood thinners. But why is Mineta higher up than either of the other two? I've only said negative things about him. Because Mineta's useful! Mineta is unfortunately very useful. He's very intelligent and very good at using his power when he needs to, to actually be effective and useful. His power on paper is really, really mediocre, literally being sticky balls that he can pull out of his head. They're very sticky and they're very tough. Don't know how long they last either. They never really specify if they have a half-life. But this power is underwhelming, especially when you compare it to like Bakugo or All Might. And yet somehow Mineta still manages not only to survive, but to thrive in hero society. Primarily due to his intelligence and his effectiveness with his quirk. That's what they're called, by the way, that the quirks. I've been saying power, but like, it's called Quirk. I don't know anybody who's ever watched or read My Hero Academia that actually likes Mineta or that Mineta is their favorite character. But if Mineta is genuinely your favorite character, please let me know why in the comments. I am curious, to say the least. As we approach the midway point of this list, I want to clarify something. These are the characters that I feel most exemplify this list. The next three ride the line almost perfectly. Alright, hey, 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 don't, don't leave, don't leave. Let me defend myself. Yes, Theon is on my list, and he's actually one of the characters that I consider the best for this particular purpose. Theon's really, really a morally gray character, and he finds no joy in any of the things that he does, either. He's only doing them to attempt to win his father's affection. It's a really common theme in Game of Thrones, and I think there may be some underlying trauma that George R.R. R. Martin is trying to get out with all of this. Ramsay is a captured slave who's been serving the Starks for the majority of his adult life. When given the opportunity to betray them, he does, even though they've treated him fairly well over the course of his servitude because he wants to get back to his family and his father and his kingdom. He's a prince. I mean, that, like, legitimately, he is a prince. But he's also a coward, and that's his number one character trait. Theon does everything he does because he thinks he's going to be on the winning side but he's also really bad at picking the winning side. Theon, or Reek if you're nasty, makes some of the stupidest decisions most consistently in all of Game of Thrones. From leaving the Starks to trying to escape the Boltons to doing everything else that he does, he's neither brave nor smart, but he is nuanced. He has his own motivations, and he keeps them fairly hidden from almost everybody else around them because, again, he's a coward. He doesn't want to share or divulge this information unless he truly feels he can trust you. The only people he ends up genuinely trusting is his father, who betrays him immediately and loses his trust right away, and Ramsay, uh, who I don't think he trusts as much as fears, but he does listen to Ramsay. Everything about Theon is based in survival. He wants to survive because he is afraid of not surviving. That, to me, is a good character trait. That's a a good character, especially when you compare Theon to almost every other character in Game of Thrones who are not cowards, they're not afraid, you really see this stark contrast between him and nearly all of the others. Theon is a coward to his very core, and Reek to his very soul. Ross may be the worst friend, but I genuinely believe he's the most necessary out of the entire group. Yes, I genuinely believe that. I I had a whole discussion with a friend of mine about how Ross was a necessary character. And to be perfectly honest, I'm gonna do a whole video on Ross, most likely next. But for the sake of the list, I'm gonna go ahead and kind of go over a short version. A big trait that hateable characters tend to share is that you want them to be punched in the face, right? Some of them do get punched in the face. Not nearly as many as need to be punched in the face but a few of them do. Ross in particular really needs to get like kicked in the groin though. He's an egotist, he makes terrible decisions regularly, he's kind of a downer, and basically all of the other friends just seem to tolerate him for the most part because he's Monica's brother. Friend groups are complicated, people are complicated, and people make bad decisions all the time. Most of the time on TV and especially sitcoms, 
you don't really see the effects of these bad decisions. They don't extend much further than the episode that the problem is introduced in. Ross's problems follow him throughout the entire show. He begins the show with a problem. Everyone in his friend group gives him shit constantly for the dumb decisions that he makes. He just doesn't seem to, like, grasp basic concepts sometimes, and social cues and social norms are generally lost on him. A very on-the-spectrum-coded kind of character. But even though Ross is not the glue that holds the friends together, he's definitely still the one that keeps them from breaking apart. Zenitsu is Mineta, but better in every way. Zenitsu's complicated as well, though. I just want to clarify that, because he is still the same stereotype. If you don't loud, like that stereotype, all of that, he's like still short. Uh, but where Mineta loses me is the extent of his perversion. It's constant, it's ever-pervasive, it is everything about Mineta. If you ask anyone about Mineta and about his character traits, they're gonna say, oh, he's got balls and he also is a pervert. It's the only thing most people know. Early on in Demon Slayer, Zenitsu is very, very Mineta coded. They're very, very tit for tat. It's a little more complicated than just that, of course. I mean, it always is. Nothing's ever that simple. Zenitsu's generally more of a tolerable character than Mineta is. Not just in the way that he's not quite as perverted, because especially early on in Demon Slayer, Zenitsu is just as bad. Where Zenitsu wins me over is by being a character and not just a stereotype. Mineta is useful, yes, but Zenitsu grows as a person. The only new character trait or new development in Mineta that I can tell you in the last few years is that he's bi now, I guess? Maybe Pan? So my final two are both characters that I like more than I dislike. I actually really enjoy both of these characters, and one of them you can probably guess. But before we get into it, I want to talk about a couple of honorable mentions, especially because I know some of you are asking some questions right now about some of these. Joffrey didn't make the cut because I just wanted Joffrey to die. No redeeming qualities, not a good person. Like, I get he was raised in garbage like Ramsay, but at least Ramsay was competent. Like, Joffrey's not even that. Same can be said for Umbridge. When she's carried off by the centaurs near the end of Book 5, I just wanted her to never come back ever for any reason, but, you know, she has to because she can't just die. I mean, you don't think they kill people in Harry Potter, do you? Let me rephrase that. You don't think they kill people when it's not the killing curse, do you? And Dwight Schrute didn't make the list either because I don't like The Office. Sorry, that's just... It's facts. I've tried. I've tried multiple times. It just it, it doesn't do it for me. I don't know how niche this one's gonna be. I don't know how big of a book this is at this point. I feel like it's probably pretty big. I feel like I'm not gonna lose too many people on this one. But Ryland Grace, the main character from Project Hail Mary, is simultaneously one of my favorite and least favorite protagonists of any book I've ever read. He's intelligent, he's qualified, and he's funny. Traveling through space in order to save the entire planet Earth from an impending apocalypse. And he has no way of knowing if this is even gonna work. He does it anyway. He goes out, he goes into deep space, into uncharted territory, just... <sighs> the whole time you're traveling with Dr. Grace, you hear his monologue, you hear his thoughts, you hear the things that he says, and Ryland grows on you very quickly, or at least he did for me. He's a little rambly. Uh, I think that's more the author's writing style than anything. He tends to go off on just math and science and stuff, but I can deal with that because it's a science fiction book. It's a very science fiction book too, just the same author that wrote The Martian if you've read that. Ryland has a moment way later on in the book, and I'm not going to spoil it because it's a really, really heavy moment. Near the end of the book, it's revealed the circumstances at which he was sent on this mission, and it changes the entire perspective of the character that you've built up this whole journey. The moment in question bordered on character assassination as far as I'm concerned, but the more I thought about it, the more I sat and let it mull around in my noggin for a little while, the more I liked it. The only thing that I'll say about it is that the trait that is most prevalent in Theon, cowardice, is what is at the center of this moment for Ryland. And to make it clear, it's pretty evident early on in the flashbacks at least that Ryland is a coward. So it fits to an extent. I do still disagree with it a little bit. I, I, I disagree with the extreme levels that it goes to, but it still works. And the resolution is still good anyway, so I don't mind. I listened to the audiobook of this one as well, just, just FYI. Check it out, please. If you like science fiction, give this one a listen or read or whatever. The narrator does a phenomenal job, and overall the experience was really just stellar. Wow, no way, Snape's number one. Oh, wow, shocker. I know, I know, I know. This has been said before, and it's been said by people that are way better with their words than I am, but I'm gonna give it a quick shot. Snape's introduced as a bully. He's a teacher that just doesn't like Harry for seemingly no reason. You find the reason 
pretty early on, and it doesn't really make things better. Like, Snape's still being kind of a tool, he's still kind of a prick, and you're just like, alright guy, like, I get it, you're a nice guy, I get that you got beef with James, but, like, you also love Lily, which means you're gonna treat Harry like shit. Not following that logic, I don't, I don't really get that. I mean, I understand he's a jealous, petty man, but where Snape succeeds is at the end of the story. Snape has always been a pretty complex character and a pretty nuanced one as well. Despite not liking Harry and despite not liking most of the main cast, he still goes out of his way to be a good protector. And Alan Rickman also sold him so well in the Harry Potter movies. Again, not a shock, I know, to anybody watching this, but he genuinely did a phenomenal job. I'm gonna spoil uh, the big twist, by the way, if you haven't like, if it hasn't been spoiled for you already, I, I don't know how you managed that, but, you know, here you go. Snape does not kill Dumbledore. As it turns out, it's even more complicated than that, because Snape isn't even a bad guy. Like, he's a bad guy, but he's not a bad guy, you know? He's a jerk, but everything he's done is to essentially keep his deep cover. He's been working undercover with the bad people for a long, long time, and he has to have their trust. He has to be this awful, terrible person. He has to be... A villain. At the end of the story, though, when things are at their most bleak, their most dire, Snape comes through. In essentially a single book, Snape redeems his entire character from books one through six, to the point that people I know personally shifted completely, like a 180 transformation from I hate Snape, he's a prick, to Snape is my favorite character in all of literature. I mean, that's gotta be an accomplishment, right? <laughs> There you have it, my list of characters I love to hate. Some are more hateable than others, and some are more lovable than others, but all of them are just a mixed bag. And that's a good thing. People are not just one trait, they're not just one aspect. They are complicated and nuanced. People, even the best people, make bad decisions. They do bad things because that's how life works. No person on this planet has never made a stupid decision. No person on this planet has never made a bad decision. No person on this planet has no bad traits. And when most characters in most media are just a jumble of either entirely good or entirely bad traits, you have to learn to appreciate the ones that are at least a bit more relatable, even if they get on your nerves. Thank you guys so much for watching, I appreciate it so much. If you like the video, like, comment, subscribe, do whatever you need to, do whatever you want to. I mean, it doesn't really matter. If you made it this far, you're doing more than most, so thank you. Ross video probably relatively soon. I don't think it'll be too long. I'm not like, I'm not like the biggest fan of Friends ever, but I do like it. I, it is a bit of a guilty pleasure for me, and I do know more about it than I probably should. I know it's weird also that I like Friends, but I don't like The Office, but I also don't like Seinfeld or The Big Bang Theory, so I can't really explain it. But yeah, y'all have a great rest of your night.